This next story is super simple in its outcome, but very complicated in how we got there. A California county judge from Alameda has ruled that Prop 22 is unconstitutional because California's constitution doesn't allow that kind of measure written the way that it was written and affected the way it was affected. Short version is that Prop 22 was the referendum in which California voters overturned or amended the law regarding drivers, Uber drivers, Lyft drivers, DoorDash drivers, classifying them as contractors versus employees. The state of California had ruled that the drivers were employees. The Prop 22 measure created an exception so that those drivers are classified as contractors. This is a big deal. Contractors take care of their own work. They get an assignment like build a staircase and then they go and get the materials and the tools and, and set the schedule and they build a staircase. Whereas employees are told where to show up. They're given the tools. They're given specific instructions. They have to do it within the guidelines of their employer or the rules of their employer. They can be fired if they don't do what the employer wants, even if it's wrong, whereas the contractor does it their own way and is really only responsible for the outcome. It also affects how taxes are paid. Employees will be covered under state workers' compensation laws, including unemployment and other equal pay and other employment laws, whereas contractors are generally not regulated so heavily, and contractors also pay their own taxes. So generally speaking, you pay the contractor $1,000. The contractor then has to pay the taxes on the $1,000 of revenue, minus expenses, profits, become self-employment income. They have to pay their own social security taxes to the federal government, pay any federal and state and local income taxes. Uh, I know that Pennsylvania recently implemented a rule where when you're paying a contractor, you now have to send the tax directly to the state so the contractor can't try to skip out on paying the state their tax. But generally speaking, contractors have a lot more employment freedom for both the contractor and the customer, whereas employees fall under a lot of employment law restrictions, which are meant to benefit the worker, protect consumers, protect the companies as well, but are often seen as burdensome to the company like Uber or Lyft or DoorDash, who now have to contend with all of these drivers having more employee rights than they did before. So in the Superior Court of the State of California, County of Alameda, this judge has granted a petition for what they call a writ of mandate. Petitioners petitioned the court to issue a writ of mandate compelling respondents, the State of California, not to enforce any provisions of the Protect App-Based Drivers and Services Act as unconstitutional. And this will come up a few times. It is section 7448 et sequitur, so 7448 and the rest of the act. The act was adopted by the people of California directly as an initiative statute and is more popularly known as Proposition 22 as it was so denominated in the 2020 general election ballot. The state opposes the petition, as do the proponents of Proposition 22, who have intervened as respondents in this case. The California Constitution vests in the legislature the plenary power, unlimited by any provision of the Constitution, to create and enforce a complete system of workers' compensation. A plenary power or plenary authority is a complete and absolute power to take action on a particular issue with no limitations. It is derived from the Latin term plenus or full. Petitioners, 
argue that by exempting workers previously classified as employees from workers' compensation, Prop 22 has infringed on the legislature's plenary power to create a complete system of workers' compensation. The legislature has the power to include or exclude workers from the workers' compensation system. Before Proposition 22 went into effect, the legislature passed an act adopting the ABC test for employment status, which was understood to reclassify app-based drivers as employees. Under the ABC test, a worker is considered an employee and not an independent contractor unless the hiring entity satisfies all three of the following conditions. So the way they phrased this, if they satisfy these conditions, the employee or worker is an independent contractor and not an employee under the law. So if the worker is free from the control and direction of the hiring entity in connection with the performance of the work, both under the contract for the performance of the work and in fact, so you can't just contract around it. You can't write a contract that says, I agree that I'm an independent contractor and, and that somehow gets around the law. So the worker has to be free from the control and direction of the hiring entity in connection with the performance of the work. Well, I'm getting the impression that Uber and Lyft direct the employee much more than they tell an independent contractor, this person needs to go, needs to get picked up, go figure it out. Instead, they say they need to get picked up here. They need to get picked up at this time. They probably direct what pat, what, what route you take through their app and they handle payment and they hand instead, if it was an independent contractor, they would say, Hey, we got a customer that needs to be picked up. Here's their phone number. Call them. Then the independent contractor would say, okay, where do you need to get picked up? What time? And here's my fee for that. That would be much closer to an independent contractor. Element two, the worker performs work that is outside the usual course of the hiring entity's business. So if I'm a bookstore and I hire someone to install a staircase, is that person an employee or independent contractor? Well, am I in the business of installing staircases? No, I'm in the business of selling books. Now, if the bookstore hires an employee to sell a worker, if the bookstore hires a worker to sell books, that's going to fail this test and is going to look more like an employee. So an independent contractor would install a staircase in a bookstore. Would a independent contractor drive for a company that does driving? Hmm. So this is sounding more and more like Uber drivers are employees. Third, the worker is customarily engaged in an independently established trade occupation or business of the same nature. Okay. Does an Uber driver have the right to go take other ride app work? Can they be an Uber driver or a Lyft driver and a DoorDash driver and just you know, one, one day they're an Uber driver, the next day they're a DoorDash driver, or even in the morning, they're a DoorDash driver in the evening, they're an Uber driver. Are they allowed to do that? If they're allowed to do that, then that's more like an independent contractor. If they're not allowed to do that, if you're only allowed to drive for Uber, but you're not allowed to drive for Lyft, uh, despite how many people might actually get away with it, we're talking about in fact, not, um, in practice, but if, if they, are allowed to work for other companies. Um, I think about this with editing, like I do editing with these videos, right? So if I hire someone and they have to work on my videos and my videos exclusively, that might be closer to an employee. Whereas if they're free to go edit other videos, as long as they get the work done for me on time, that's more like an independent contractor. The key provision of Proposition 22 provides that notwithstanding any other provision of law, including but not limited to the labor code, an app-based driver is an independent contractor and not an employee or agent with respect to the app-based driver's relationship with a network company if certain conditions are met. This section exempts app-based drivers from the ABC test that would otherwise be applied to determine their status as employees or independent contractors. As a result, app-based drivers have been removed from participation in the workers' compensation system as presently codified because it protects only employees, not independent contractors. 
Proposition 22 is not an improper exercise by the people of a power entrusted only to the legislature, says the judge. The term legislature includes the people acting through the initiative power, the ballot initiative. Long-standing California decisions establish that references in the Constitution to the authority of the legislature to enact legislation generally are interpreted to include the people's reserved right to legislate through the initiative power. Proposition 22 is constitutionally problematic for another reason that defies such easy resolution. Petitioners and amici law professors also make the more subtle argument that the independent energy producers case, which we haven't reviewed yet, is distinguishable because the statutory initiative in that case increased the power of the Public Utilities Commission, whereas Proposition 22 limits a power vested in the state legislature by the Constitution. The Constitution also provides that the legislature shall have the power to create workers' compensation laws unlimited by any provision of this Constitution. What I want you to focus on there is that we're really looking at the Constitution, but this was an initiative statute, not an initiative constitutional amendment. However, the Constitution also provides that the legislature may not act to amend or repeal an initiative statute without a subsequent vote of the people. These two provisions are in conflict. If the legislature's authority is limited by an initiative statute, its authority is not plenary and unlimited by any provision of the Constitution. Rather, it would be limited by the Constitution's Article 2, Section 10, Subdivision C. The Supreme Court has held that, as an interpretive guide, the initiative power should be zealously protected and any reasonable doubts should be resolved in favor of the exercise of the precious right, the initiative power. But here, the plain language of Article 14, Section 4, indicates that it is unlimited by any provision of the California Constitution. When Section 4 was ratified in 1918, the statutory initiative power already existed in the Constitution. The grant of plenary power to the legislature conflicts with a limitation on its power to amend an initiative statute under Article 2, Section 10. The grant of power is not plenary if the legislature's power to include app-based drivers in the workers' compensation program is limited by initiative statute. It is not unlimited by any provision of this Constitution if it is limited by an initiative statute. The plain meaning of the Constitution's plenary and unlimited clause governs over the more general limitation on an amendment in Article 2, Section 10. In short, if the people wish to use their initiative power to restrict or qualify a plenary and unlimited power granted to the legislature and by the Constitution, they must first do so by initiative constitutional amendment, not initiative statute. Proposition 22's section 7451, remember it started at 7448, 7451 is therefore an unconstitutional continuing limitation on the legislature's power to exercise its plenary power to determine what workers must be covered or not by the workers' compensation system. When the people adopted Proposition 22, they expressed their intention that its provisions be severable, except that if Section 7451 is held to be unconstitutional, the whole act should be stricken. So the judge has now ruled that the one section is unconstitutional and therefore the whole thing has to be unconstitutional because that's the way it was written. The California Constitution provides that the people of the state may enact laws through the initiative process. When the people pass an initiative statute, the legislature's power to amend that statute is limited by the California Constitution. Quote, the legislature may amend or repeal an initiative statute by another statute that becomes effective only when approved by the electors unless the initiative statute permits amendment or repeal without the electors' approval. So the law would have to say that it's okay to enact the amendment to the initiative statute or the new law without electors' approval. 
Because the voters have the power to limit or allow amendment to their initiative statutes, they also have the power, a fortiori, denoting or based on a conclusion for which there is stronger evidence than for a previously accepted one, to attach conditions to permissible amendments. Proposition 22 also included an unusual provision allowing the legislature to amend its provisions, but using an unusual procedure. The legislature may amend Proposition 22, quote, by a statute passed in each house of the legislature by roll call vote entered into the journal, seven eighths of the membership concurring. So by a supermajority of seven eighths, provided that the statute is consistent with and furthers the purpose of this chapter. Any statute that amends 7451 does not further the purposes of this chapter, says the definition. Proposition 22 also provides two additional specific definitions of what constitutes an amendment. Quote, a statute that prohibits app-based drivers from performing a particular rideshare service or delivery service while allowing other individuals or entities to perform the same rideshare service or delivery service or otherwise imposes unequal regulatory burdens upon app-based drivers based on their classification status, and a statute that authorizes any entity or organization to represent the interests of app-based drivers in connection with drivers' contractual relationships with network companies or drivers' compensation, benefits, or working conditions, and those are what constitutes one of those amendments. Petitioners argue that these substantive definitions of a subsequent legislation as amendments is unconstitutional. These provisions are ripe for a facial challenge. We're going to skip that. The, the judge just rules that, yes, we can challenge this. The law professor, Amiki Curie, state that they have been unable in their research to find another initiative statute with amendment restrictions as stringent as Prop 22. However, interesting, this point is irrelevant. Everything in Section 7465 is in the nature of an exception to the default amendment rule. If Section 7465 had not been included, the legislature could amend Proposition 22 by simple majority vote, according to each House's rules, followed by a popular referendum. So the House, the two Houses of Congress, the California Congress, pass the law and then the people vote on it at the next election. With Section 7465 enacted, the legislature can still amend Prop 22 by a simple majority vote according to each house's rule, followed by a popular referendum. All Section 7465 provides is another way to amend the initiative statute, albeit one that is difficult to the point of near impossibility. To the degree that Section 7465 attempts to apply conditions to amendments proceeding under the Constitution's majority vote then referendum procedure, they are unconstitutional. To avoid the constitutional conflict, the court should narrowly construe the seven-eighths majority and consistency requirements only to the non-referendum procedures in 7465. Similarly, to the degree that 7465 purports to require 12 days of publication of bills amending Proposition 22, those rules may be unconstitutional to the degree that they purport to apply to bills proceeding under the majority vote than referendum procedure. Each house of the legislature is empowered to determine its own rules of proceedings. To avoid the constitutional conflict, the court narrowly construes the publication rule to apply only to the non-referendum procedure. So the judge is invalidating the law's attempt, Prop 22's attempt to exclude amendments and updates is trying to, the, the law is trying to take away the power of the legislature to make another law that changes the law. And that goes too far is the short version. Petitioners argue that other parts are unconstitutional because they interfere with the judiciary's power to say what is or is not an amendment under the California Constitution. This is contrary to their plain language. Both exceptions reference compliance with 7465, which describe an optional, no popular vote process for the legislature to adopt amendments to Prop 22. Even if these subdivisions were susceptible to petitioners' interpretation, the court may avoid this conflict by by construing them as clarifying definitions. 
as part of its power to allow amendment without further vote of the people, an initiative statute can define the scope and conditions that must be met to adopt an amendment without a subsequent referendum. There are two important constitutional limits on the people's power to limit future acts of the legislature. Regardless of the conditions set by an initiative, it can be amended by a legislative statute if that statute is ratified by a vote of the people. The second limitation is implied by the initial grant of of power, an initiative statute cannot limit subsequent legislation unless that subsequent legislation would constitute an amendment to the initiative. A statute can constitute an amendment in several ways. First, it can literally change or alter statutory language. A statute amends an initiative when it is designed to change an existing initiative statute by adding or taking from it some particular provision, but that's not the only way. Conflict with existing law is neither an essential nor a normal attribute of an amendment. A statute also constitutes an amendment if it adds to or takes away from an existing statute. If its aim is to clarify or correct uncertainties which arose from the enforcement of the existing law, or to reach situations which were not covered by the original statute, the act is amendatory, even though in its wording it does not purport to amend the language of the prior act. There is no other language in Prop 22 that directly relates to labor representation or collective bargaining. The proposition proponents argue that the independent contractor status is incompatible with collective bargaining, that one of the fundamental issues Prop 22 addresses is the right of app-based drivers to work as independent contractors, a status that precludes them from collective bargaining under a century of state and federal law. They further argue that any subsequent attempt by the legislature to reimpose on app-based drivers traditional employment relationships like collective bargaining rights would undo this choice. But the most maximal state law covered by subdivision C4 would create a guild through which independent contractors would bargain collectively their contract terms and working conditions. This may alter their bargaining power vis-a-vis -vis the network companies they contract with, but the court cannot find that it would diminish their independence or transmute them into employees. The court therefore finds that subdivision C4 unconstitutionally purports to limit the legislature's ability to pass future legislation that does not constitute an amendment. Proposition 22 itself states that to the degree that the provisions of 7465 are determined to be unenforceable, the people intended its remaining provisions to continue in full force and effect. Initiative statutes must be limited to a single subject. Courts interpret the term subject liberally to uphold initiative statutes which disclose a reasonable and common sense relationship among their various components. The general test is whether the parts of a statute are reasonably germane to a common theme, purpose, or subject. Proposition 22 itself tells us its purpose, to protect the basic legal right of Californians to choose to work as independent contractors with rideshare and delivery network companies throughout the state to protect the individual right of every app-based rideshare and delivery driver to have the flexibility to set their own hours for when, where, and how they work, to require rideshare and delivery network companies to offer new protections and benefits for app-based rideshare and delivery drivers, including minimum compensation, insurance to cover on-the-job injuries, automobile accident insurance, health care subsidies for qualifying drivers, protection against harassment and discrimination, and mandatory contractual rights and appeal processes to improve public safety by requiring criminal background checks, driver safety training, and other safety provisions to help ensure app-based rideshare and delivery drivers do not pose a threat to customers or to the public. The common theme, purpose, or subject of Prop 22, then, is protecting the opportunity for Californians to drive their cars on an independent contractor basis to provide those drivers with certain minimum welfare standards and to set minimum consumer protection and safety standards to protect the public. Workers' compensation is a benefit afforded only to employees. The proposition also provides different alternative insurance for on-the-job injury for app-based drivers. No other part of Prop 22 deals with collective bargaining rights other than Section 7465C4, and it does so only obliquely and indirectly as a side effect of a contested construction of certain antitrust laws as barring independent contractors from bargaining collectively.
This is related to Prop 22's subject, but is utterly unrelated to its stated common purpose, a prohibition on legislation authorizing collective bargaining by app-based drivers does not promote the right to work as an independent contractor, nor does it protect work flexibility, nor does it provide minimum workplace safety and pay standards for those workers. It appears only to protect the economic interests of the network companies in having a divided, ununionized workforce, which is not the stated goal of legislation. The court finds that Section 7451 is unconstitutional because it limits the power of a future legislature to define app-based drivers as workers subject to workers' compensation laws. The court finds that 7465C4 is unconstitutional because it defines unrelated legislation as an amendment and is not germane to Prop 22's stated theme, purpose, or subject. Because 7451 is not severable from the remainder of the statute, the court finds the entirety of Prop 22 unenforceable. Petitioners are ordered to serve and file a proposed judgment and form of writ consistent with this order in 10 days, so I'm guessing the judge will then issue the final judgment in about 10 days. So yeah, that was really complicated, but that's what the court had to go through to discover or figure out that since there was a conflict between the California state legislature's power and the way Prop 22 was written, the limitation on the legislature's power, that was unconstitutional and therefore the law that made that limitation was unconstitutional because you couldn't sever just that one portion and keep the law, then the whole law is unconstitutional. This will probably not be the last you hear of Prop 22. This order is just a county of Alameda judge, state court judge ruling. This will be challenged in the appeals court, probably to the whatever the Supreme Court or top court of California is. And if Prop 22 continues to be ruled unconstitutional, then you'll probably see another ballot initiative to try and implement the same kind of thing. I'm curious then how it will resolve the conflict with federal law because the federal government still wants its income taxes and if the companies are not paying employee income taxes and the contractors are not paying contractor self-employment taxes, the federal government's going to want to figure out how to enforce that. And either you're going to get a bunch of a whole bunch of uh, IRS office actions against people who file with the wrong designation as contractor or employee, or there's going to be some federal court, potentially federal court action where the federal government, the IRS, tries to enforce employee compensation laws on Uber. I don't know. I don't know how that gets resolved but it's really complicated. So let me know what you think of that. For right now, Prop 22 is unconstitutional according to this Alameda County Court judge. We'll see what happens from here, I'll let you know. Let me know what you think in the comments. And that's today's video. Special thanks to our top supporters in August, John Steele, Gavin Barnard, Evie, Spirit Bear, Benjamin Hightoff, Ugly Grill, Torpedon, Brandon Abel, Shadow Tycho, RDH Dragon, Earthbound Star, Pure Magma, Drew Hart, and Eric Tams. You can support Lawful Masses on Patreon.com slash LJ French, Sponsus.com slash Law, through YouTube memberships and through Floatplane subscriptions. Join me for our weekly production stream on Twitch.tv slash Lawful Masses on Sunday mornings at 10 a.m. Eastern U.S. time. I hope everyone has a great week. I love you all. Bye.